And uh, Tim, I don't know, are you sharing a PowerPoint with us? Uh, yes, I am. Tony is in charge of it, though. Okay, perfect. Um, because Good. that way, Zoom is kind of, is a wonderful app, but it's kind of uh, fussy when you co-host and have a PowerPoint. So awesome. I will be giving Tony signals. All right, good, fine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, get comfortable. Tim Durkin is an acknowledged expert in developing leaders that need to operate in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. In the last five years, he's delivered more than 500 presentations. His clients are organizations of all sizes, from entrepreneurs to IBM, Ford, AT&T, Ernst & Young, and KPMG. Tim is an instructor and former academic director in the Southern Methodist University's Cox School of Business for Executive Education. Before he started his company, Seneca Leadership Programs, he was a successful management consultant at Ernst & Young and a C-level executive for the world's largest wholesale trademark. He is a certified coach in mental management systems, which is used by dozens of world champions and elite performers. This is the program I wanted you to hear. He has promised you will learn several tools to improve results. His book is called Moving from Promise to Performance. The late Stephen Covey, author of Seven Habits of Highly Successful People said, Tim Durkin is one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Derek Jeter, former captain of the New York Yankees, said anyone wanting to learn how to be a better leader should call Tim Durkin. And he is with us today. So please welcome one of my very good friends from the National Speakers Association, all the way from Texas, Tim Durkin. Well, uh, I think we can all first agree that it's absolutely wonderful being a friend of Patricia Fripp. But I will also tell you that to be introduced by Pat Patricia Fripp is another level of life achievement altogether. Thank you very much, my friend. I am very, very honored. It is also a big honor for me to talk to the Golden Gate Breakfast Club, and I'll tell you why. You're almost 75 years old, and I have just sat and watched the camaraderie between the members, and I am absolutely amazed. So um, it's an honor to be with you, and it's also an honor to be with my colleagues from the National Speakers Association, uh, the Northern California chapter. Uh, I also want to thank in advance, hopefully I wouldn't forget it, Tony Woodall, who has helped me immeasurably prepare for this day, and is also my audio visual expert. Uh, he is going to be advancing the slides for me uh, for the reasons that I shared earlier. All right, so let's start out today. The name of the program today is With Winning in Mind. Um, it's managing the mental game. So the first thing that I wanna ask you is what percentage of what you do in your life is mental to earn your money? What percent? I'd like to ask you to put it in the chat box. I'm going to take a look at your answers and see what, what the average is. What percentage of your work is mental? So 80, 100, 97, we've got 100, another 100. 90. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if I ask that to an athlete, they almost always answer 90% or above. I asked the United States amateur boxing champion in the heavyweight division, Cam Austin, what percentage of boxing is mental? And without a moment's hesitation, he said 98. No, no, it's 99. And he went on to explain how much mental preparation is required for boxing. 
and all of the work that is done. And once you get in the ring, it doesn't stop. You really have to stay mental, uh, mentally prepared and mentally active. And your job, he said, is to get the other person to stop thinking. And he said, there are several places you can hit somebody in a boxing uh, match that will stop their thought process. The point is we do 90% or most of us average in our work, 90% mental. So the next question that I wanna ask you is what percentage of your time, energy and money do you spend developing your mental capacity? Let's put that in the chat box. Forty, fifty. I get five, seventy, seventy-five, ten, seventy-five. Interesting. Most of the time, we get answers twenty-five percent or below. And the question that I have then is, if it's re if you had a a factory and there was one one machine in that factory that was responsible for 90% plus of your profits, how would you treat that machine? Obviously you'd keep it very well oiled, you'd keep it very well maintained, you might cover it with a blanket at night and sing it lullabies. If it presented 90% of what you earn, you would take very, very good care of it. Yet we see very little mental management preparation done by most people. So. Today, what, you're, what, we're going to, what I'm going to leave you with and what you can take away is first of all, an understanding of how mental management can work for you. And I very specifically use that word can, not will, because there's a major difference between can and will. There are four steps to development. First step is information, which I will be providing you today. The second step is um, application. Most people that go through training stop at the first step and think that having gone through the training, they will develop into better leaders, better presenters, better speakers, better golfers. But there's, the second step is application. That's on you. The third step is confirmation. Confirmation as to whether or not what you did with the information, worked, didn't work, the extent to which it worked. And the fourth step is consultation. Now, one of the very best speaking coaches in the world is Patricia Fripp. And that is the process that she takes speakers through. She gives them information, she makes sure they apply it. They then talk about confirming to what extent it happened. And she is then available as their coach for consultation. Now, when I say can, you can make mental management work better for you. The question is, will you? It will take those four steps. The second thing is an insight into something that is called the triad state. There's going to be more about that. You will look at what you do in mental capacity area much differently when you understand the triad state. The third is that how you can use the three stages of any task to improve performance. Virtually every single thing that we do in our professional and also our personal lives has three stages to it. We don't typically take a look at them separately, but if we did, we could improve performance. And then throughout the presentation, I'm going to tell you how to take the next step to improve your mental management. So what is mental management? Mental management is the process of improving a probability of having a consistent mental performance under pressure and on demand. Because oftentimes under pressure and on demand, our mental management wavers. But there's two words in there that I wanna pay close attention to. They are process. Mental management is a process because ladies and gentlemen, wherever there is success, there is a process.
And you have to know what the process is in order to have the success. And the other word is consistent. We're looking for consistent, great performance, not inconsistent, great performance. That's, that drives people mad. Now, where did mental management come from? It came from this gentleman. That man is Lanny Basham. That picture was taken the year that he won the gold medal in Montreal in the 1976 Olympics. He won the gold medal for the United States and he won the gold medal because he lost the gold medal in 1972 in Munich. And the reason that he lost it is because it's not correct to say he had a mental breakdown, it, he didn't, but he lost control of his mental management. He was helped along by the competitors from another country that we all know of that shall go nameless um, because they sat behind him on the bus to the range and virtually got inside of his head. So what Lanny did after that was he created a system that is built upon a model, a model which is supported by principles and he used it personally to win. Just slightly more detailed, as the silver medalist in 72, he called every gold medalist that he could find from Wilma Rudolph to um, uh, Bruce, now Caitlyn Jenner who won the decathlon, um, he, he, and he said, there, there's one thing that is good about a silver medal. It is you can call any gold medalist and have your call returned. And he quizzed them on how they mentally prepared in all of their performances. He took all of that information and created the mental management system. Now, a few of our customers include these people here. The FBI, the United States Marshal Service, um, you may not know this, but the U.S. Marshals, arrest more people than all federal law enforcement agencies combined. The three gentlemen you see on the top row, David Keim on the far left is a five-time world shooting champion. The man in the middle, Uk Sool, is a South Korean. He won the gold medal two times after Lanny. And the man on the far right, the, the larger fellow there, his name is Todd Bender. He is a 28 time world champion in skeet shooting. Todd Bender is so good at skeet shooting that his miss rate for clay pigeon is once every 69,000 times. Um, the, uh, United, uh, the Navy SEALs, signified by the trident there, uh, use the mental management systems. Brandon Webb discovered Lanny and the mental management systems. Uh, he created the, the SEALs uh, program around that. Plenty of PGA golfers, names you would all recognize, but we are um, forbidden from mentioning non-disclosure. The United States Secret Service, the young lady in the center happens to be one of my clients in mental management. She was Miss Texas. She was runner up for Miss America. I have personally coached using mental management. The last three women that have become Miss Texas, um, it's a very competitive, uh, beauty pageantry is very competitive, uh, as you might imagine, um, to every single contestant, I can also say are outstanding uh, women. Um, the person to the right is, um, is Chris, um, uh, the, the Chris, Chris Kyle, the American snipe, sniper, may he rest in peace. He is a student uh, going around the bottom. Um, the Olympians, there's uh, 100 national, more than 100 national, international, uh, and world champions that are using the mental management systems uh, in the Olympics and otherwise. Uh, man in the far left of uh, the bottom right corner, that's Marcus Luttrell. He is the lone survivor. He's also trained in the system. Now that little guy jumping the hurdle there, that is a dog. No, we do not teach dogs mental management, but dog agility is the fastest growing sport in America. There are literally tens of thousands of events. And as you can imagine, a dog's performance in the agility contest is largely dependent on their handler. So we do train handlers. As a matter of fact, um, the two best dog handlers 
uh, training and mental management are Californians. So um, those are some of the people that we use. Now, what is a mental system? A mental system defines the op optimum thing, sorry, Patricia, the optimum thing to think about before, during, and after a task. What is the thing that you need to think about? It's mental management. And by the way, I wanna make it very clear. Mental management is not mental toughness. Mental toughness is but a part of mental management. And it's a very good discussion as to whether or not mental toughness at the Navy SEAL Marine recon level can even be taught. These people have these people are just wired differently. I, I promise you that. All right, so an interesting fact that Lanny uh, discovered is that 95% of all winning in any given sport is done by 5% of the participants. And if you wonder about that, think about tennis. What are the names that you constantly hear? Nadal, Djokovic, um, Pete Sampras back in the day, John McEnroe, Yvonne Lendl. In golf, it's uh, Rory McIlroy right now. It used to be Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson. Um, even though the PGA membership is hundreds and hundreds of people, the same 5% continue to win. In football, it's Tom Brady, uh, maybe Aaron Rodgers. Those are the names you typically hear. Go through any sport and you will find that. Now, the question is, how do, why is that? It's how the top 5% think. Number one, the top 5% actually believe that talent in itself, the skill is overrated. It comes down to the mental aspect. The second point I wanna make, and this is a very, very big point. I mentioned it earlier, I wanna stress it. The top 5% are process driven rather than outcome driven. And if we had more time, we'd do a little exercise around that. But the reason that they are process driven and not outcome driven, the reason they don't try to shoot the, shoot the ball uh, into the net or hit the ball into the hole is they can't control the outcome. The only thing within a performer's control is the process that will bring the odds of the ball going into the hole the bullet going into the bullseye, the speech being delivered out, out in an outstanding manner is process driven, not outcome. They also know that trying 110% is a sure way to lose. There is an over trying response in the way that, the, and there is also an overthinking response. The number four is huge, and we're not seeing very much of it today in these times. The elite performers, the type, top 5%, they control their thoughts rather than letting the environment control them. We all know, and sometimes when I look in the mirror, I see myself being controlled by thoughts of what's going on outside the world, what's going on with the leader of our country, this one, the previous one, the one before that, the one before that, what's going on with the, uh, the taking, I'm very distracted by many and my thoughts and then my mood is sometimes affected by my environment, and I teach this stuff. The fact of the matter is elite performers control their thoughts very, very strictly. And finally, the elite performers understand the role of self-image. Now, I wanna to get to three mental processes. We're gonna talk about the three mental processes, which is conscious, subconscious, and self-image. We're gonna represent those by three circles. The first circle is the conscious mind. The conscious mind is what we think about. The defined conscious mind, the, 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 the strong conscious circle, or in order to make a strong conscious circle, you have to have a defined primary way to think before, during, and after a task. You have to have a way to think before you deliver a speech, before, during your uh, meeting, and after the presentation. You have to have a defined primary way of thinking. You also apply the right amount of mental effort. 
and most importantly, to build a strong conscious circle, your thoughts are synced with what you are physically doing. If you are getting ready to make a presentation, you don't worry about what you're going to cook for dinner that night. If you're going to make a sale, you don't walk into that sale thinking about the argument you just had with your significant other. Your thoughts are synced with what you are doing. The principle of conscious that underlies this model is that you cannot think of more than one thought at a time. Multitasking is a myth. If you think you are multitasking, what you're actually doing is flickering uh, between tasks. Now, the subconscious has to deal with your skills. And a strong uh, subconscious circle requires high quality instruction. You want to be a good speaker, you work with Patricia Fripp. You want to be a great speaker, you work with Patricia Fripp. Um, you have to have high quality instruction outside of yourself if you're going to get better. You might have a mentor, uh, you might have a coach, but you have to get skills based on high quality instruction. And number two, you have to practice. You have to have a lot of repetition and the practice must be deliberate practice. You don't just go out onto the golf green, or excuse me, on the driving range and mindlessly hit balls out to the 150 yard mark. You have to have a lot of repetition and it has to be very deliberate practice. I love the phrase that says that the amateurs practice until they get it right, but the professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. It would be a very good argument to see if Todd Bender could actually purposely miss a, a clay pigeon. Um, he, he is that grooved. Now, uh, the, the, if, if you, the principle behind the subconscious circle is that if you have to think about how you're doing something, it's still a conscious skill. It is not a subconscious skill. Think about when you were driving. You were driving and at first you had to think about everything that you were doing, turning left, turning right, indicator, hands attendant to, um, stopping, starting the whole thing. If you had a standard or a stick shift, you really had a lot to think about, letting out the clutch, um, it, pressing down the accelerator, shifting the gears. All you did is you hoped by, you prayed to God that you wouldn't be driving and end up on Bradford above Tompkin or um, on Filbert between um, Hyde and uh, Leavenworth uh, and stop there if you had that. That would require an awful lot of uh, skill. You would not be in the subconscious circle. Now, let's also talk about now the third circle, which is self-image. And self-image makes you like act like you. We cannot outperform, as a rule, if you were taking notes, you can't outperform your self-image. You are what you are. You are what you believe you are. Um, I'll give you an example. I am not a golfer. If I went out on golf, to golf, I guarantee you that I would hit 100. I, I'd be above 100. But if by chance I went out one day and on the first nine, I hit 36 par, I would be way past my personal best. What do you suppose I would hit on the back nine? Well, if you said 64 you, or more, you would be right. Because at the turn, I would think, this is crazy. I'm, I'm way over my head here. This, I, my self-image around golf is I'm not a very good golfer. I'm a terrible golfer. So if I did happen to hit a 36, now this is the same thing if we're making a speech, if we're making a sales call, oh, they probably won't want to buy from me because they just bought uh, from another person. This deal won't go through because our price is going to be too high and so on and so forth. So how do you um, work with the self-image? The self-image is built when we start to respond instead of react, th this is talked about in Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. Uh, it's, a, it's the second habit, actually. It says that, that we have responsibility. When something happens to us, it doesn't necessarily throw us off. We ask ourselves, what did we learn from that? 
this also the strong self image is is driven by a real strong belief in your ability now elite performers though are extremely proactive and protective in protecting their own self image if they hear something that is not what they believe about themselves they cancel it they you know this is one place where the cancer cancel culture will pay very, very strong dividends. For example, if you're trying to lose weight and you know that you have to change your self-image, you say to yourself, it's now like me to not eat a hamburger with a bun on it and with cheese on it, but just eat the meat patty. It's like me now to forego large meals for salads. If we didn't have a strong self image, we would say things like, it's really like me to want to lose weight, but more like me to have that chocolate cake, to have that additional beer, whatever it is. So what you want to do is if you want to change your self image, the best way to do that is with something called imprints. And there's three kinds of imprints, actual, environmental, and imaginative, and all three of them will work to enhance or can work against enhancing our self-image. Actual imprints are actual events. For example, if you were on a sales call and you closed the sales call, that's an actual imprint that you are a good salesperson. If you were made a speech and got a standing ovation, that's an actual imprint. Uh, if you were entered a tournament in golf and you won, that's an actual imprint. So you now feel like a higher performer. The environmental imprints are from our past and our present. Obviously, the way we grew up and the home that we grew up in created an awful lot of environmental imprints. Um, parents are strong in environmental imprints. Um, the, the, most psychologists will tell you that we are the sum total of the five people that we are closest to. So environmental imprints weigh on us all the time. Um, the most dangerous one for negativity right now is the media. Um, finally, the imagined imprints are anything we think about, talk about, or write about um, puts an imprint in our mind. So we have this triad state now, which is like this. This is where the thoughts, the skills, and the self-image are in alignment. So um, this is a beginner. They have to think a lot. This is when you were first playing a sport, driving a car, uh, becoming a professional speaker. This one is a person that is unfocused. They're not thinking about what they're doing. They have the skills, they have the self-image, but they're mailing it in. And finally, this is the overconfident person whose self-image is um, larger than it should be based on their uh, conscious and their subconscious circles. So the th important thing to remember is that nobody can defeat a person like this with three concentric similar size circles. No one can defeat them except this person. Now this person is represented by the 5%. The previous person was represented by all of the other people on the PGA Tour or in the speaking association, or in whatever uh, endeavor you can imagine. So now I wanna talk about the three phases of a task because paying attention to the three phases of a task will yield huge dividends for you in areas of improvement. They are three. One is the anticipation phase, then there is the action phase, and then there is the reinforcement phase. The first one is the anticipation phase. It is what do you think about before the action? What do you think about before you hit the shot? What do you think about before you go into that sales call, before you make that presentation, before you have that difficult conversation, before you run that meeting? That's the anticipation phase. The next one is the action phase, which is what you think about during the action. I will tell you that elite performers think process. They call it running their program. Whatever they decide their program is, they will run their program during the action phase. When they step up to the ball and they start to address the ball, that begins the action phase. And then the third one is the reinforcement phase, which is what you think about 
after the action. Now, the important thing to remember is that the anticipation phase relates to what we think about. So it's the conscious circle. The action phase relates to the subconscious. It's when the skills take over. You basically stop thinking. And the reinforcement phase relates to the self-image. And I want to get into that a little bit deeper. The mental management system, if we look at this graph, shows that the action is the execution of whatever it is we're doing, creating or delivering the speech, making the sales call, actually being in the sales call, hitting the golf ball, um, stepping out onto the stage, if you will, whatever it is. The anticipation is the preload. Now, obviously mental management came from the shooting sports, but it's been applied. It can be applied to any sport. It can be applied to any endeavor at all, but we will use preload. Now, during the preload, you determine the strategy for the task. What, how am I going to deliver this speech? How am I going to run this meeting? How am I going to, to outline this sales presentation that I'm going to make? How am I going to hit this shot? There's a dog leg to the left or the right or whatever. And then you commit to that strategy. You determine what that, now when the Navy SEALs, they do in a tremendous amount of planning. Anybody can participate in the planning, but when they commit, they commit. And then the third thing is, they rehearse the process. A lot of people say, well, we'll just visualize it. I like to visualize. Visualizing is not enough. You have to physically rehearse the process and they will do that. The next phase is the reload, which is reinforcement. And I want to talk about reinforcement because it's what you think about after the action. It is a three-step process and it relates strictly to the self-image. It is incredibly important. And normally when we uh, uh, do something, we just blow through these three processes. And we just say, oh yeah, uh, I prepared, I did it. And then, you know, the speech is pretty good. I felt it went really, really good. And there's some vague feeling that it was okay. That's, that's not, they have to be three discrete steps. So it's what you think about after the action is a three-step process relates totally to self-image. During the reload, you evaluate the action. Elite performers, they'll say, you know, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose until you lose. But if they do win, they have a very interesting perspective. They either win or they learn. And when they learn, they evaluate and they say, what part of what I did went great? What part of that meeting was okay? What part of that meeting needs work? And then they rehearse the correction. And I want you, the next time you watch golfers, after a golfer tees off, you will very frequently, everybody watches the ball, he gets a, or she gets a good understanding of where it fell. And if they liked the shot or they didn't like the shot, they will swing again before they give the club back to the caddy. Why? Because they're rehearsing the correction or they're redoing the good shot. The third thing is to let it go. Whatever it happens, let it go. You have to look back at in kind sight, not hindsight. You look back in kind sight, but you do have to let it go. Um, otherwise, you will think about it in the preload on the next shot. So, the relationship in the anticipation and the action phase is they only affect the task you are about to attempt. However, the reinforcement phase is all about the tasks you will attempt for the rest of your life. The worst thing that you can say to a child after they have a um, game or a play or whatever endeavor they're in is how did it go? Because if you ask them how did it go, we live in such a negatively charged world, they will tell you all the things that went wrong. That will reinforce the negative part of their performance. You can't let them do that. You can't do that for yourself. You can't do that for a friend. When I asked somebody how a negotiation went, if I were going to ask Derek how a negotiation went for his new Porsche, I would say, Derek, what went well? Um, what was just good? 
what would you do differently the next time? Because I want to make sure that we use the reinforcement to build the self image. Now, finally, um, Lanny Basham has written two books with winning in mind is now available uh, back on Amazon. It was sold out because Joe Rogan, who does a podcast, um, interviewed somebody with the mixed martial arts, and virtually everybody in mixed martial arts wanting to be in mixed martial arts, bought all the copies that Amazon had. It sold hundreds of thousands of copies. It's in LeBron James's library. It's a very, very excellent book, which gets into much deeper detail than I was able today. Parenting Champions is Lanny's last book. It is, um, uh, when, when we read that, we being his family and his friends and those close to him, we were stunned. We said, Lanny, everything is in here. This is it. I mean, people can get all of the, the secrets with one book. And his commitment was, he heard many times, if I'd only known this when I was young, I would have been much more successful. And Lanny Basham isn't all about winning gold medals and accomplishments which can be measured. Lanny Basham also wants to be not only what you won, but who you became. Um, again, I want to, uh, to thank all of you. I will close with this thought. I would like you to go back over your life and take a look at the things that you thought at one time were bad that happened to you, a job you didn't get, a relationship that didn't work out, um, perhaps when you were fired, um, something that happened. What you will find is that things happen for you. Things don't happen to you. The best thing that ever happened to Lanny Basham was losing the gold medal and winning a silver medal. If he didn't lose the gold medal, I wouldn't be here today talking about this. We wouldn't have 100 world champions. We wouldn't have some of the most effective special fighting forces in the world who have incredible win rates. So the last slide is my contact information. That is my cell phone. Um, that is my email address and that, that is my Twitter handle. I typically don't tweet. For some reason, it reminds me of standing on the front porch yelling small sentences, hoping somebody driving by hears it and finds it interesting. But um, I am available 24 um, six. I do have one day off where I take a hard break from all electronic devices, not for a religious reason. Um, I'm very secular about it. Um, it has increased my productivity by about 30%. Uh, name of the book is Hard Break. And I think you'll all agree that I got a really good new headshot. So um, thank you, Tony, very, very much. Went great. Patricia, and thank the members uh, of the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. I have a very, very strong love affair with, um, with San Francisco. 1969, I stayed at the Palace. I see the Pied Piper Bar. I see the Maxfield Parish. Uh, it's, it's just a fabulous, fabulous town. So um, I will sit, sit around and wait until any questions that you have are answered. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you, Tim. That was, that was amazing. Hey, Craig, may I just say this? Um, I noticed Mount Rushmore in the background. Mm -hmm. um, I sincerely mean this that if there ever is a Mount Rushmore for speakers, I guarantee you one of the name, one of the images up there will be our, your own Patricia Fripp. I don't think they need to make a Mount Rushmore for speakers. I think there's room right up here next to George Washington. I, yeah. I think we yeah, well, his place is in jeopardy, apparently. Yeah. Well, um, let's open it up for questions. But for, before we do that, Tony, do we need to end the recording at this point? Yes. Or should we do we want to do we want to continue through the Q and A? Well, let's go ahead and continue through the Q and A for now. All right. Um, all right. So what we'll do now is uh, everyone's muted. So when it, when you're called out, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. I'll be checking the chat line, and also we have the option of um, putting up a the hand. So if you, um, I'll be checking both. So let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, Paul raised his hand first. Who who did? Paul. Okay, all right, go ahead. Hey, Tim, this was a fabulous talk. Um, Thank you. I'm gonna read these books. 
I have um, a question. Can you talk a little bit about motivation and the source of motivation? So process, deliberate practice uh, uh, is fascinating. But what are the elites, elite, ad, uh, um, elite athletes finding their mo motivation in? Um, is it because they love skeet shooting or golf or being a Navy SEAL? What is it that makes them want to do what they do? I actually believe it is the way that they are wired and they have found something that they are absolutely wired for. Now in Tiger Woods case, um, by the way, he did not have a choice. His father put a club in his hand at age two and he did have a lot of talent. But when you take a look at the Navy SEALs, they have typically, they have thought about doing this uh, for a very, very long time. Um, the, the person I'd point you to is a Navy SEAL over in California doing a lot of work named Jocko, J-O-C-K-O, Willink. Um, he's very good on discipline. They are wired, uh, elites are wired for discipline and they are wired for practice. Actually, unlike most people, elite performers enjoy practice. It's never a drudge for them. Um, like Tom Brady, he, he, he just, he can't stop um, practicing. He really, truly loves it. Michael Irvin, who was a wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys, um, first on the field, he just, he couldn't, he loved practice. So they have this intrinsic motivation. It can be developed if your goal is strong enough. And here's how you decide if your goal is strong enough. Will you change, will you trade your life for it? I don't mean die for it. I mean, will you use the number of hours that it takes in deliberate practice and study and physical mental discipline to make that sacrifice worth it? Lance Armstrong was on a bike 10 hours a day. We have a question from Sue Ann, uh, Susan Rowan. Unmute yourself. Suzanne, Susan, unmute. Okay, I want to know um, what people, what country the people were from who whispered in Lenny's ear in 1972, and also 1972 was a very disturbing Olympics for the obvious reasons. Yeah, but I do have a, uh, I do have the answer for you. The recording's off, Tony. No. It's okay. Well, it doesn't matter because Lenny talks about it. it was the Russians? Um, they got behind him and they stole his rifle. And uh, a rifle is like an appendage, and they finally found it in the Russian woman's weightlifter's locker room, a place that nobody would go. In 1972, you may be interested to know that the United States Olympic shooting team was directly across from the horrific events that took place mm -hmm. in, uh, in Munich, and they had their rifles with them they had their eyes on all of the terrorists, but they were not allowed to have any ammunition in the Olympic Village. They could have ended everything before the tragedy, but they were not allowed to have ammunition. This is the most interesting fact that I never heard, thank you. Well, the, Lanny was there, Lanny was looking out the window. Um, he has a third book that's actually his best book. It's called Freedom Flight. It's a one hour read. It's about how he flew to the world champion. He's 12 time world champion um, in addition to Olympic champion. Um, but his book, Freedom Flight, very thin, um, one of the top five books I've ever read and the story of how he started. Um, it doesn't get into the area that I just started, but you asked, I'm happy to answer. All right, thank you. We have any other questions? I'm sure we do. Janice Blitton has one. Janice, please, please Janice. speak up. Uh, Tim, that was one of the best presentations by far that we I have ever seen ever, and I know Patricia will and Susan will agree with me. So one thing that it's because of Patricia, by the way. I'm sure. <laughs> yes. I'm sure it yeah. is. And Tony, Tony helped me in rehearsal. I, I'm very serious. <laughs> So I'm working on a book. You can see on either side of my head, uh, my book cover, which is called Banish Burnout and teaches people how to change 
their behavior in reaction to stress. And one of the things that I talk about, which you touched upon, was the environmental impact. And in the book, I have a chapter on teaching people how to go back into their past and try to connect their emotional problems today to what happened in their past. And I'm assuming that you have some sort of commentary on, on that because if somebody was emotionally abused or verbally abused as a child, I can't imagine them being able to become a champion. Um, actually, it can be a big motivator, um, because, especially if they were abused and told they were worth nothing, and, um, and then they decided that they were going to prove that there is something. But um, it, Janice, I want to make you aware that you are very close to a heck of a resource on stress management. Um, at Stanford, a friend of mine is Dr. Ali or Alia Crum. And she is a magnificent researcher, Harvard trained, and now teaches at, Star at Stanford. And she has studied with her group the effects of stress. And here's the funny thing they found about it. If you think stress is bad for you, it will be bad for you. But if you think stress is an opportunity to make you grow, it will make you grow. So uh, right now she's doing some COVID research on how that's happening. And I, I actually don't know specifically what it is she's doing, but she is absolutely brilliant. She is the daughter of Tom Crum. If you've ever been on a speaking circuit and seen Tom Crum, uh, he's absolutely fabulous. So uh, I, I, it, it's a very interesting book. I, I will buy your book as soon as you let me know it's available. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, Janice, we're going to have to have you come out when you're ready to launch. We'll do a big push oh, for you. Okay? Um, for sure. Yeah, and also, I just have to, I'll have to, uh, Tim, I'm with you. And Patricia, um, I review her videos every week. So hopefully it helps my presentation skills here at the Breakfast Club as well. So, um, and I appreciate, I appreciate her so much. Well, her uh, most recent video is the reason that I ended with the way I did which is, and you, you know, her, this, this week's video was kind of end with the flourish. Nothing happens to you. Everything happens for you. Yeah. I'm a can I got cancer in 2007. I will tell you, not everybody can say this. I respect that. One of the best things that ever happened to me, happened for me, um, brought me to Johns Hopkins. Uh, I speak at John, I spoke at Johns Hopkins, teach their leaders. Uh, but at first you don't think so, but looking back, made me a lot of money too. Yeah. So, but that was, that was a technique I learned from Patricia. If you're in this business for anything less than 50 years, you should be listening to her every week. Uh, Bill, Bill Buchanan has a question, Bill. Uh, good morning, Tim. And thanks for a great presentation. Uh, Thank you. I read, uh, Stephen Covey's book, uh, seven habits of highly successful people many years ago. And I was very impressed with it. Uh, it helped me organize my life and my business and stuff like that. Yours is, 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 is in a different vein of, of emphasis. Um, <laughs> as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, you know, uh, I'm a clay pigeon shooter. I like to go up the, to the uh, range up north uh, Marin here with an over and under shotgun. So I've got to get a hold of uh, did you say that ben, Bender has written something on Todd Bender? Um, no, but actually Todd Bender and Lanny Basham do have a shooting school uh, right. held here in Texas. But they also, uh, Lanny, if you go to mentalmanagement.com, I put that on the on the contact sheet okay. there at the end. Mentalmanagement.com, they've got several programs on how to shoot better clays if you're into shooting clays or, or skeet shooting. Um, but they get on the mental management systems mailing list and, uh, and you'll get all kinds of information. Okay. Uh, with regard to Stephen Covey, Derek Arden is hosting um, a review of the book, which I happen to be doing next Monday. Um, Stephen is a very close friend of mine. When he said, I'm one of the most amazing people he ever met, I met him very early in his career before he knew very many people. Um, and he could safely say that. Um, but we were uh, colleagues. He was a very close friend and a mentor. And the seven habits applied is, uh, is remarkable. Yeah, um, so uh, you can get into Derek's session next week. 
um, and, and Derek can send you information or we can send it through Tony. Uh, I'll check that out. Yeah. The other the question I had for you, uh, Tim, was that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in society as we know today. And uh, one of the theories, it goes back to our education system and perhaps some failures uh, overall uh, at various levels, K-12 and colleges and that sort of thing, because uh, the theory is that, you know, things are happening that just don't make any sense if you're a rational thinking person. And critical thinking, that phrase comes up all the time, in my mind anyway. And I just wondered whether your program has any um, segue over into the uh, educational uh, and teaching profession. Well, um, two things. The answer is yes, we did. They did create a program for high school students. They tried it at one program in at one high school in Missouri, the superintendent okayed it. The results were absolutely phenomenal. All of the athletes who took it, um, not only did they go to the state championships, but they were all almost all on the honor roll. Wow. Um, and that program is available for school districts, but it's extremely tough to get it into school districts. Mm -hmm. But the, it, you can teach young people this. I do believe there is a failing in our educational system like you, and I, and I think it is in some part due to what's going on now. Uh, but with regard to critical thinking, you're not seeing any of it. Um, my primary work, especially if you go to my website, you'll see very little on mental management. Um, I talk about teaching leaders the, uh, how to operate in a VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. What you need to remember there is that you have to avoid confirmation bias. And confirmation bias will be the end of Western civilization. I, I sincerely mean that mm -hmm. because we will only agree and only support those ideas with which we agree. Right. When we need to apply critical thinking, which is they could be right. I never thought about that before. I never saw it through the lens because of my environmental imprints or what have you. So in my classes for uh, training leaders and VUCA leadership, I, I talk a lot about developing critical thinking tools. And yeah. I have uh, five or six of them. That's great. Thanks for a great presentation, Tim. Thank you for the comment. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We have a question from uh, Betty Teich. Hi, good morning. Thank good you morning. for an amazing and very informative presentation, Tim. Thank you. Uh, two questions. First of all, I loved what you said about how did it go uh, in terms of the reinforcement part, that that's not the question we should be uh, asking people, but instead, uh, let's see, you said, uh, what went well, what would you do differently? So when people say, well, how was your day? And then you kind of think about maybe instead saying, um, well, tell me something positive that happened today. I mean, could you comment a little bit more about that? And then my second question is, can you comment more about multitasking or questions? Um, well, yes, to take the first one, um, it's really not a good idea to ask your loved one as they walk in the door, how was your day? Okay, it's tell me what good happened. Now, this can be very unnerving. Because think about it, you walk in and the first thing you've got to do, you've had a bad day and you think maybe nothing good would happen. And then you look at your loved one and they say, so what good happened today? And you just grit your teeth. But the fact is, it forces you to think about something that is good. Couldn't have been all bad. Couldn't have been all bad. I had a great day already today. I walked into a room and actually remembered why I was in there. <laughs> okay, it was the bathroom, but still, it counts, all right? But the, but the idea is that, that you, you have to get people thinking in terms of the positive to protect their self-image. Otherwise, they begin to hate their job. If they hate their job and they're still doing it, they hate themselves. Um, as far as multitasking is concerned, a lot of people think we're really good at it. And, and now think about it. We've been on conference calls. Conference calls are the... Are, are, are the fertile valleys of multitasking because we're checking emails, we're writing, we're reading, we're checking it. But it's, it is called flickering. We go in and out. When Here's an example of Tiger Woods with his conscious mind. When Tiger Woods, and by the way, um, I just heard a great interview by Hugh, on Hugh Jackman by Tim Ferriss. They are very, very controlled thoughts before they go. Did you know that before or during a golf tournament, 
Tiger Woods is not allowed to make six, more than six decisions outside of the golf game. In other words, he doesn't drive because he'd have to decide where to go, which way to go, when to turn. He doesn't make his, um, he, he doesn't ask for what, what, what am I going to eat? It's provided for him. Now he may tell in advance, I want this or I want that. He doesn't even determine what, decide. he doesn't even decide on the day of a game, a match, what to wear. It's all, so all of his thoughts are focused on his actions. And when we can get all of our thoughts focused on our sales call or on our presentation or on our surgery, you know, surgeons have magnificent attentions and they can focus on whatever it is that they want. They might need music to do it, or they might need the scrub nurse um, that is special that, that can read their thoughts because they have ESPN or something. I don't know, but, but their, their thoughts are driving their actions. And multitasking is the antithesis of the conscious mind. Thank you. I hope that was the answer. All right, no, it's uh, 8.52 right now. I mean, how are you doing on time, Tim? I think we can- I'm, I'm doing great. I've, I've got, I, I've cleared my schedule. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think just, you know, we should, we should definitely end things by nine just to be you know, respectful of everyone's time. Uh, but I think we have time for another question or two. Well, uh, yeah, I, and, I, and, and again, I can wait. I certainly respect the fact that they have other things to do besides listening to me. But uh, seriously, I, I will stay as long as, as, as anyone needs. Uh, you were so generous. And I, I, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like, you know, you talk about flickering, right? You know, and I, I'm on my side trying to kind of keep track of things. And, you know, because of my position, I have to be kind of flickering a little bit to try and keep things on, on track. But um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's distracting because you have so much good information and I'm trying to be present, you know, and thank well, God we're recording this. As good as you did that, um, the flicker award has to go to Tony. Because you saw the signal, right? Every time I did this, Tony and I worked out. Because originally I said this, and then Tony said in rehearsal, Durkin, you're always doing this. So I don't know where the heck you're going. So I had to go flat hand. So oh, I, I think you pretty much uh, caught on to that. Yes. Um, you, Patricia, you have a question. Well, one, I want to say thank you very much for your generosity and your focus, because as you notice, Good speakers also do rehearsals no matter how many times that they have presented or presented this content. Because I always insist with all my clients, I want to bring in my own moderator because I don't want to look at the chat. I don't want to look at the polls. He re reports to me. And my brother, you know, who is a world-class musician, he always says the best part about being unemployed is that you can practice eight to 10 hours a day. See, and yep. even after 50 years and great acclaim, even when he's on tour, he practices every day. Yep. So with that, thank you, Tim. You can all see why I wanted to hear this presentation again and why I wanted you to hear. And with that, I have a nine o'clock coaching client in England, so I need to go to my own Zoom. But thank you, Tim. Thank you, James, Derek, and all the other frippets that came in. And I'm on Derek's mail list, so when I get the information on the seven habits, I would for I'll forward it to Craig and Tony if he wants to share with everybody. And and Gary, I'll make sure you you love this so with that thank you pals i'll see you next week thank you Bye. Bye. take care thank you patricia thank you tim thank you everybody thank great you. presentation thank that was you. amazing tim that was great thank you very much i learned a lot for that well you're very very welcome and please keep in mind being a friend of fripp and now being a member of the golden gate uh, breakfast club um, and NSA NorCal because I'm NSA North Texas. Um, these these coaches that you call me, there's no charge. There's no charge for that. I mean, please don't. You know, I I, I do this because you're a friend of Fripp, you're a member of the Breakfast Club, or you're a colleague or a speaker. So uh, if if you were thinking that that I would uh, charge you for contact, no, no please. I want to make that very very clear. 
Um, it's, uh, you know, once you reach a certain level, you have to send the elevator back down. I can't tell you how refreshing what you just said is because so many of our clients think everything is a revenue stream and they forget we, as I wrote in my books, have to earn our planet points and yep. give. And what you just said means so much. Thank you for that. Well, you're very welcome. Your career is what you get paid for. Your life is what you do. Tim, I love what you just said. Once you reach a certain level, you send the elevator back down. Yep. And it's all about mentoring and being a leader and bringing new people, let's say, into the real estate field and mentoring and, and developing new leaders is so important. We've been there, done that, and can guide, but we don't, shouldn't keep doing it ourselves. I mean, we do. And there's, there's real benefit for that. Yeah. for the mentor too. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, uh, I caught onto that early and I mentored a number of people, for example, at Ernst & Young. And uh, I think the greatest joy in my business career is watching some of these people that I help put on the elevator and they blow right past me. Of course, I'm on a low floor, but they blow right past me and they're now you know, chairman of the Americas or chairman of the European operations um, or... Um, self-made millionaires. I, I mean, it's just, uh, it's a, it, mentoring is a very, very much a two-way street. Mm -hmm. um, you get a whole lot of insight, especially if you mentor a millennial. Oh, be prepared to learn. And, and by the way, go in with an open mind um, because millennials want to work for the greater good. They, they don't want to work, they're, they're not driven by the the things that we as uh, other generations were. Thanks. Yes, Lynn. Uh, you're muted, yeah. Lynn. You Sorry, thank you. I'm writing a book on women's breast health. And it, of course, it comes up against cancer. And people just go crazy thinking they're such victims when it comes to cancer. And I so appreciate you saying what I know and what many people know, that illnesses can be a challenge and a gift, mm -hmm. and you learn from it. But mm -hmm. it's very tricky bringing that up because people say, oh, you don't understand. So it's quite the dance talking about that. So I very much appreciate you sharing with this whole group again. Well, the, the points I'd, I would add to that, Lynn, thank you very much for your yeah. work, um, is that I uh, uh, attended a seminar once long before I was diagnosed. And they said, if you ever get a, a dangerous disease, um, you know, you can ask people to pray for you or, or something like that. Um, but the big thing is to ask, what can I learn from this? And so when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was active at that time in a church and I had thousands of people saying prayers for me. But my, my biggest mission was what can I learn from this? And I learned and I was taught the difference between disease and illness. Disease is what the patient has. Illness is the social impact of what the patient has. Uh, and if you have somebody nice. with a traumatic brain injury, you have somebody with Alzheimer's, the illness uh, uh, is applied to the entire family, to the entire circle. Um, an autoimmune disorder. Um, I have a, a friend, a friend, I have a son um, that has PTS um, that, that affects the family. Um, not, not just him. So the disease affects the individual. I had prostate cancer disease, but the illness uh, affected my children. They were worried about who's going to take care of them. I can't take care of them. I already have one baby at home. Somebody else got to take care of dad. Um, so um, I, I think that's very, very important is what can you learn from it? Um, and I don't make light of the fact that uh, some people do have very, very significant lethal forms of cancer. Um, and I think it's wonderful. All right, thank you. Thank you. And do we have any other questions? Uh, Derek? Yeah, that was great, Tim. Thanks very much for that. Can you just run a couple of things to pass me? Uh, you said once you reach a certain level, you have to send the elevator back down. I've heard you say that three times. That's absolutely uh, fantastic. And then you said, what well, is what you get for you. paid for? A life is what, and I didn't write that down. 
okay, a life is, um, is what, you, what you do. A career is what you do for money. A life is what you do for the world. For a legacy. For the uh, world. Yeah, it's, a, it's a legacy, yeah. Um, it's, it's, I think it's real important to, keep the camp, to leave the campsite better than you found it. Yeah, I love your metaphors, by the way. Uh, I love your metaphors. That's why I've asked him to appear on my chat show. I run for, I've run 48 chat shows since lockdown. They're all on YouTube, on my, on my YouTube channel. And um, it's cost me quite a lot of time and money. And it's all up there f uh, free. And I've been in interviewing. Tim's done three interviews with me. They're all on there. And uh, Shelley Rose Chave, Patricia Fripp. Um, Peter Thompson. You named the, uh, name the best speakers at NSA. Uh, see, uh, they've all come on and donated their time and their information and their legacy because legacy is really important to me. So if you ever invite me to your breakfast club, then I'll share some of my negotiation tips and uh, from England, which are different, a little bit different to the United States. Yeah, but you're very mid-Atlantic. You, you understand us. <laughs> he said, you're a bit softer in, uh, in the UK than, uh, than we are. Um, we are in America and he said that very politely but I knew what he was saying so hopefully I'll uh, I'll share with some share with you some of my secrets and if you can join Tim and I on uh, Monday evening at five o'clock London time which is about um, what's that about nine o'clock their time yeah nine a.m. delighted to talk to you see you or or whatever thank you for inviting me Thank you. Thank you yeah. We'd love to have you come back to you, Derek. Yeah. It'll be yeah. my pleasure and honor, as Tim says. Yeah. Privilege yeah. and honor to uh, share some of the things that I've been privileged to, to learn. I think I've been to the USA about 20 times to learn and uh, sit in audiences, sit at NSA. Got a High Point University with Nito Cobain. Woof. And uh, if I can pick well, Patricia Fripp's not on this now, but if I can p pick Patricia up at Heathrow and drive her two hours to Wimborne and have her captive in my car with a recording machine giving me tips, gee whiz, it was a total no-brainer as you can, you can imagine. Fabulous. Great, thank you. So, uh, Christopher, you have any question? Tana, Christine, anyone? I have a question for you. Tim. Okay. All right. So I'm a, I'm a real estate agent. Um, so of course, so much of what you said applies to what we're doing, you know, because uh, it's just, you look at the numbers, it's all, it's true. And, um, but then I have a side gig, you know, it's not a gig, it's just more of a passion. So, you know, how do you balance between being focused on one activity and then mentally shifting to another one for maximum effectiveness? Because you have to make a living at the same time. I mean, real estate can be so all encompassing. Yeah, yeah. Um, my advice there, because there's no real definitive answer other than to say, once you shut one off, you start the other one, but you do shut one off, mm -hmm. okay? And then you just have to, if you call flicker, uh, I'm not sure that's the right word, but you laser focus one, and then you laser focus the other. I do believe it will become very frustrating if your side gig or your side hustle and your main uh, job, if they start to intermesh like that, it could be very problematic uh, in terms of mental management, I would think. They're so different. One's a right brain activity, the other's a total left brain activity. Yeah. You know, so that helps distinguish it. But, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, you know, because you want to stay present and focused on any task you're working on. Yep. Yeah. Do you know, I think one of the biggest challenges we face today is staying present. Uh, I, I think we are, we are looking and we are in conversation with people and you know, our mind is elsewhere. Our mind is, what are we going to do at come election time? What are we going to do? Um, you know, when are we going to be able to take off the mask? When are we going to be able to go out to eat again? When am I going to enjoy the palace uh, garden restaurant again? It, 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 it's, it's, being present is a very big job now. The other one is the critical thinking. Um, I, I cannot tell you how important that is, which is checking your assumptions and uh, asking why, 
why, you know, five times. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about that critical thinking versus confirmation bias. Uh, very, very uh, slippery slope. I'm glad you brought that up, you know, earlier, because that was um, making that distinction is so important, you know, because, you know, we can all get confirmation bias. It's so easy, but that, yeah. that doesn't push you to expand your brain or your mem. you know, just, you know, it's not a liberal education, you know, it's not a liberal no. thing at all. No, no, oh, no, it's not. Um, I, 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 yeah. I'll give you an example. One of the joys again of, of getting, um, old, uh, one of the pleasures of getting old is to me is finding out how wrong I was. For example, I considered beauty pageantry to be populated with women who won the beautiful gene, uh, you know, the lovely looking gene and could probably sing or dance. Outside of that, I did not have a very strong opinion of them. I have been wonderfully amazed at the depth of the women that compete at the state level, and by the way, I did work with one in Miss California contestant, um, of how committed they are, and they have to be, to a social engagement, to a social program. And they have to prove that they're working in that and what they have done in that. Uh, teen suicide, um, one of the contestants' best friend committed suicide. Did you know that 3,400 high school age teenagers attempt suicide in the US every day? Now that's, that's a pandemic, but, but you know, and she talked about how you deal with kids and how you look out for these things. So anyway, um, I, you know, I was proven wrong. These are women of substance and they are going to change the world for the better. Um, and, and they blew my confirmation bias to smithereens. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Very grateful. Janet, did you have another question, Janice? No, no, my husband's waiting for me to go to Costco. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, I was just telling him what a great uh, presentation and I'm going to go over it all with him in the car. <laughs> okay. Okay. Don't forget your mask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think Bill had Bill was raising his hand. Yeah, I have a uh, just a, a, a comment about. Uh, actually, it's a question. Okay, <laughs> uh, Tim, uh, I'm just as you're speaking, I'm thinking about uh, your resume, which is so impressive. You're such an accomplished uh, person in so many at so many levels, and I'm just wondering when did your interest in this mental management uh, subject kick in? And at, at, uh, you know how, how effective was it from that point on? Um, a great question. Uh, the my field is teaching leadership, and I taught leadership, and I began to teach leadership in the VUCA environment because, as Gartner found out, seventy-five percent of companies will experience an event in the next eighteen to twenty-four months that could threaten their existence. Of those 75% that experience that event, 80% of them will go out of business within two years. That number is now 100%. 100% of the people have experienced, businesses have experienced the pandemic. So I'm trying to prepare leaders for the volatile, uncertain, complex. So where do I look? I look for the tough people. Um, I'm a former Marine, um, infantry platoon sergeant. And um, I, I was exposed to great, great leaders. And I wanted to emulate them. And I use war fighting as an example, not because I'm a warmonger. I don't believe anybody wins a war, actually. But the, the idea was that's leadership under the most dynamic circumstances and the highest payout, if you will. The stakes are the highest. So I studied, I started looking at these people and I read a book by Brandon Webb and he talks about getting mental management training from this guy in Flower Mound, Texas. Well, heck, I live five miles from Flower Mound, Texas. I didn't know this guy existed. So I call him up. He says, come on over. We'll talk. I'm talking to Lanny Basham and he's, he's unbelievably warm and friendly. 
And so then he said, well, we do have a coach's certified program and we did this. And then I started practicing it. And the way forward, by the way, the best thing you can do is not only do the three, the three stages of the task and take a look at what you do in all three, but, and I regret I didn't say this, is that you then journal how it went. You write down what went good, what went, what went great, what went good, what needs work. And you journal, and that is amazingly effective in increasing your ability to improve. So it was, I follow Jocko Willink, uh, Mark Devine. Uh, I know an awful lot, I don't know an awful lot, but I know a number of special operators. I go shooting a lot with them. I enjoy target shooting. And, uh, and I see these guys and I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at what strong leaders they are, but they never, they, in, in the circumstances I'm with, they never yell. Um, so uh, I found out that the Navy SEALs use mental management. And then I looked into mental management and the current world men's archery, current world women's archery champion are students of Lanny's. Um, so, uh, I just started with leadership and the best leadership in the most volatile environments, understand mental management, mm -hmm. understand critical thinking. Um, and so I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. And thanks, uh, for, for your reference to the military. I was a Marine officer in the Vietnam area. It, and, is that right? When I think well, that, I, well, so you know what an 0311 grunt is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. Uh, your... Uh, were you in the, in the Vietnam? Did you go yes. over? I did uh, in Vietnam and with the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines out of uh, Camp Pendleton, you know? Yeah, yeah. Were I was 1st Battalion, 24th Marines. You were absolutely 24th Marine Regiment? Yes, sir. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, they, they, their, their moment of glory was Fallujah. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, Ramadi. It wasn't really a moment of glory. I had yes. severe casualty, forty-two percent. Exactly. That yeah. was really intense. Yes, uh, Betty. One quick question: Did you um, the Adventures of Rufus and Tim? Is that that's not by you? And is it a child's book? Uh, no, that's Timothy S. Uh, Durkin. It's oh. not mine. Okay. Um, I did write Moving from Promise to Performance. It's now two hundred and thirty-two consecutive weeks on the New York Times non bestseller list. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it, I am writing another book, by the way, called Points of Impact. Every page will be a leadership um, point. Um, try to keep it one paragraph. Um, it's all done. I just need to get it edited. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to be ending the recording now. So okay. thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. Tim